Thank you. Good evening, everyone. It's my absolute pleasure on behalf of the University of Tasmania to welcome you here this evening to hear from the indomitable Tasmanian university alumnus and legendary journalist, Martin Flanagan. Before Martin joins us on stage, and as a reflection of this institution's recognition of the deep history and culture of this island, the university wishes to acknowledge the Latamarana people, the traditional owners and custodians of the land upon which this campus is built. I'd also like to recognise the enormous work being done by the Tama Valley Peace Festival, the banner, banner under which tonight's event is run. I'd specifically like to acknowledge the Peace Trustees here with us this evening, Janine Healy, Alderman Hugh McKenzie, Mark Baker and Joe Archer, Tam Foster and Donna Bain, both members of the Peace Trust, Sonia Hindram, Program Coordinator, Tama Valley Peace Festival, Ross Hart, MP, Member for Bass, and Councillor Peter Kearney from the West Tamer Council. As many of you would be aware, the Peace Trust was first conceived by Mrs Jean Hearn and follows in the footsteps of the late Tasmania Governor Peter Underwood and the challenge that he gave every one of us in the community to be mindful of our actions and to learn how to create peace in our backyards. Tonight, Martin will be presenting a short film about his father, Arch Flanagan, and his experiences as a Japanese prisoner of war during World War II, and revealing how this helped him move towards peace and reconciliation in his own life. Many of you will be familiar with Martin, one of Australia's great wordsmiths, whose skill in portraying football and the complexities of humans, their layers and depths, is unparalleled in Australian sporting journalism. Martin also has a long and proud association with the university, and in particular, the Uni Footy Club. So in searching for an anecdote tonight, in true Tasmanian form, I did not have to go very far and was able to chat with my uncle, who played with Martin in the 70s. I didn't tell you this before. <laughs> my uncle, known as Panda, comments when he was writing to me, read like a bit of a sledge, so I'll quote, he can't kick, can't mark, can't run, and in fact runs like a duck. Hence his nickname, Flaps. <laughs> but boy, can he write. I don't, uh, I don't know if, if I went to a game on Saturday to win or just to get the buzz from reading On the Ball, a weekly feature Martin wrote. He could make ordinary men heroes, a grubber kick, poetry in motion, a lift, an ordinary chess mark to extraordinary heights. Martin was about people, any person, fathers, players, trainers, girlfriends and wives. He was the champion for the underdog, the downtrodden and the unlucky. On a more personal note, it, it is a real pleasure to introduce Martin. I've really enjoyed the conversation we've just had before tonight started. But for 10 years, I had the honour of working at the War Crimes Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia in The Hague. But like many Tasmanians, returned home regularly for a little breather. One year I was back, I happened upon Martin's book, In Sunshine or in Shadow, a memoir about going home. Now, at the time, I probably romanticised my childhood in Tasmania, so it was quite confronting to read Martin's words, which were not all happy memories, but instead a more nuanced exploration of Tasmania's history, how it informs our own personal experiences. Which is why tonight we are so fortunate to have someone like Martin to speak with us, a man who can meditate on what peace means both as a personal reflection and for our community. As Panda concluded in his reminiscences to me, Martin is the essence of what is important in life, people and their rich tapestry of stories and experiences. I ask you to join me in welcoming Martin Flanagan.
Well, thank you very much for that uh, very kind introduction. Um, it's lovely to be back here in Launceston. Um, when World War II broke out, Dad's family were living at 27 Burn Street in Vermeer. And when he finally got home from the war, that was, he came back to Launceston and it was to 27 Burn Street in Vermeer that he went. My grandfather and my uncles both worked <clears throat> in the railway workshops that were here. And um, in an additional historical irony tonight, the original Flanagan was a convict um, who was sent as an assigned labourer uh, to William Archer's property um, just outside Longford at Brickenden. And tonight the chairman of the Peace Trust is Jo Archer. She's not from that branch of the Archers. So, um, and it's not just myself who's descended from, um, from that particular convict, so is uh, Dane Swan, the former Collingwood footballer. Uh, but it's a lovely thing that uh, an archer and a Flanagan would come together 170 years later in the cause of peace. So, um, <clears throat> growing up, um, as you'll learn in the doco, um, I never heard Dad speak very much about his experiences. And then between the ages of 70 and 90, he wrote these four pieces that reflected on it. And um, a publisher in Melbourne said to me, because um, I always knew I would write about it at some time, and she said to me, you should do it while he's still alive and make it a gift to him. So we wrote this book called The Line. It was called A Man's Experience, A Son's Quest to Understand. And the publisher... I uh, wanted to do this short documentary just to assist people understanding the book. And she, she happened to meet this German filmmaker who was in Melbourne. And um, he was sent down to interview Dad and I thought it was just going to be an hour interview. But the German filmmaker, in, in a Germanic manner, got deeply involved in the story. And poor old Dad was subjected to about five days of <laughs> intense questioning including many questions which I would never dare to have asked. Um, and so that, the documentary tonight, was basically made by volunteers. Uh, the woman who edited it is a Muslim from Iran. Um, the fellow who did the sound was a refugee from Iraq who has since been sent back to Iraq. Uh, but they all worked on it for nothing because of the spirit that they perceived within it. So. Um, We'll watch the documentary and then um, I'll say a few words after it. Thank you. Don't give way to hating, nor yet look too good, nor talk too wise. My father was always a fascinating figure to me. He was, um, there was, there was something about him I always liked and always admired. Um, but I didn't exactly know what that was or why it was. And um, I suppose as I grew into adulthood, I for one reason or another, I, I began to understand it had something to do with the prison camps. And um, growing up, he had said very little about the prison camps. To me, at least, I'd heard very little about them. And then between the ages of 70 and 90, he wrote these four fragments that reflected on the experience. And um, I'd always had it in mind that at some point I would write about the Burma Railway because I knew that it had shaped my father and I knew that in shaping him it had shaped me and my brothers and sisters. One of my earliest memories of the uh, um, a couple of soldiers returning from World War I and uh, of course 
the trains coming to the, the trains going through the village was quite quite the event of the day, and people would go to the station to meet the trains. And they were there to meet this one because I suppose they knew that these soldiers were coming home, and these two soldiers um, got off the train and um, and one of them uh, broke away from the welcoming people, went and hung over the railing at the back of the station and, and, and cried. And I, I, was, I was quite astonished by it because back in those days people didn't cry, well men didn't cry. When I was 30 and I came to Melbourne to work with the Melbourne Age, I got asked to go and do a story on Weary Dunlop and I met Weary and and then I was doubly fortunate because Weary was part of a group of old diggers that went back to the railway and the age sent me to go with them. And so I got the chance to spend quite a bit of time with him and each night I'd go to his room and we'd drink whiskey and I'd get him telling stories and that was, you know, I mean, you're very lucky to get to know a character as large and as vivid and as extraordinary as him. And I'm not suggesting he was perfect because I think that's a folly. But I am saying as human beings are made, he was, he was a pretty extraordinary one. And then through, at the same time I got to meet Blue Butterworth, who was Weary's Batman and a, a remarkable bloke in his own right. Blue and Weary met during the Allied evacuation from Greece in 1941. Blue got asked to go and pick up an officer. He didn't have a licence and had only driven once or twice before. But that was Blue. He was always on for the adventure. I'm sitting in the car. Now, over there, the kerb is approximately, I reckon, two feet off the main street to the pavement. And you're driving on the right-hand side of the road. So there I am, in the car, and my wheel on the right-hand side, naturally. And the next thing, a dirty big pair of boots arrive in it an army greatcoat, right down to his boots. And I looked out and I started traversing. And I said to myself, shit, he'll never get in this car. He was six or four and a half, huh? Then he came around, opened the door and uh, introduced himself. I told him who I was and uh, from that very moment, I reckon that Weary Dunlop and I became the best of friends. I got away with murder with a big fella, gone. Dad came under the command of Weary Dunlop on Java. As a group, they were called Dunlop's Thousand. They were transported from Java to Singapore, and that's where they passed through Changi Prison. Dunlop asked them, he asked the leader there, Black Jack Culligan, a hard type of bloke, he asked him for clothes for uh, for us people from Java, and Galligan referred to us as the Java rabble and uh, refused to give him anything. So this is the sort of thing that Dunlop would do, you see. He not only, he not only stood up to the Japanese, he stood up to his own, um, to, to his own officers too. We were there for 10 days and when he was leaving, he wrote to uh, Galligan this famous letter Ten days ago, my men came here, uh, a bootless and in rags. I asked you for help, and you gave us nothing. Yeah. And then we boarded the, the, the trains and up to uh, into Thailand. Tommy Wren was 21 when he was on the Burma Railway. He was a tall, beautifully built young man. He was a strong, confident person, and he had reason to be. He was very good at rugby league, was a champion surf lifesaver, and he'd already fought for the Australian heavyweight title. The lion was to be his great education, not only in life, but in politics. In Doc Mountain Camp, to me, was where Weary really grew as a giant. And really, to serve under him was a great privilege. Think of Dunlop. Colonel Dunlop, you know, 
which I mightn't do today or tomorrow or the next day, and then you'll come back to me. Quite mo it, it quite moves me to think of him, yeah, yeah. He was such a... He, he, he was so... so hard and brave, you know, and yet he was so kind and gentle. Mm. So he used to tell them, you know, he, he used to stand up to the uh, Japanese commander at uh, Hintok. He said, he told him, I'll see that you hang for this after the war. Mm. You can take examples from recent history where people kept in those sort of circumstances have turned on one another. And I think you were asking me before about the Australian character of the story. That's something which, which seems to be Australian about the story because there are other Allied troops who didn't survive as well as these blokes did. That's what it was. It was a collective spirit, uh, mateship. Yeah, if it hadn't have been for that, I think most of us have gone down the drain. You'd work all day, you'd be yelled at, you'd see blokes bashed. Uh, then at nightfall you'd, you'd hope you got back into the camp before dark. I remember one bloke saying the worst thing were those bloody toilets. The toilets that uh, overran, that be, be uh, um, the refuse on the grounds, on the ground, and without boots you'd walk through that, and you'd walk back to your bed again, no, no washing or anything. I very much respect the fact that we were shielded from hate as kids. We were never taught to hate. We were never told hate was acceptable. Um, there, there might have been a certain scepticism about what might happen in the future, but that was as far as it went. And the only story we got brought up with about the Burma Railway was the story that as a man was dying, he said to some of the blokes, if you get back to Hobart, free the fish in the window of Casamati's fish shop. And when they got back, they did. They broke the window, grabbed the fish, took off for them. That was the only story I remember hearing. Um, and we never got told that the bloke who was dying who made that wish was actually bashed to death. We never got told that. I didn't discover that until I was that old. He was such a good chap. He was the sort of bloke that everybody liked. And he got on with everybody, you know, yes. The, the, that is the one thing I find it hard to live with, really. Mm. Dunlop said he never thought he could hate so much as he did when he fell under, came under the Japanese. But I think everybody was the same, yeah. And that's why today some people find it hard to forgive them because it's not for yourself for those people who died up there, if, if they are looking down and you're befriending the Japanese and friendly with the Japanese, they wouldn't be very happy. They would feel that you had let them down. Oh, Dr. Duncan, the late, he's now the late Dr. Duncan. And he interviewed our people, and I said, do you, do, 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 do you have many illnesses of the pair? He said, oh, not, not much, not much at all. And then he questioned, did you have malaria? Oh, yes, I had malaria. Did you have uh, dysentery? Oh, yes, I had dysentery. Did you have pellagra? Oh, yes, I had pellagra. Did you have beriberi? Oh, yeah, beriberi. And so it went on. 
And the fact he said, but they said, but really nothing, no stock, nothing much at all. But the fact was that everyone had it, everyone. And then, of course, when we got cholera, and you saw your mates dying, within some of them within a few hours of contacting cholera, you were going to work in the morning and uh, you came back in the evening and there they were gone. There's the bedboards, their bits and pieces had disappeared. They died with cholera. I can't recall it emotionally, but I can recall it factually. And I do remember that the worst thing was the hopelessness. The feeling of hopelessness that comes upon you. You know that You know that if you weaken, if you go down, you're out. Yeah, you're finished. You've got to keep going. The part of the book that moves me most is, is the story about Sidney Burton, the bloke who literally drowned the ship. I was about 45, I reckon when Dad told me that story. And I felt it coming. It was like you know, when you're hitchhiking and you're on a highway, you hear big trucks coming. You feel the vibration in the earth. I knew this big story was coming. He decided to tell me. Real old character. He came from the morning in the penin peninsula. He was old and he lisped. And he is, used to tell great stories about the morning in the peninsula, yeah. Um, and uh, he, he really, he really loved, loved us all, I think, you know, and if we'd been out on manoeuvres or something during the day, he'd be checking in of a night, is so-and-so in, is so-and-so in, you know, or keeping his meal and keep, keep his food for him and all this, and uh, Sid, uh, uh, he um, he came up to to Hintock and he cracked up and he was sent back to Tarso and uh, he um, very sick he went to the toilets and he fell into the toilet sort of open toilets and they got him out and cleaned him up some of the some of C Company blokes who were there. But he died a couple of days later. And uh, uh, one of them was telling me that they dug his grave, you know. And uh, of course, they only dig shallow graves. And, uh, and uh, put him in it. And the three of them, they, they were all C Company blokes. They stood around looking at one another to see who had cast the first sod. Mm. That, that I find very, very moving, very, very, very sad, yeah. Mm. Tom Uren's maiden speech in the Parliament was about Hintock and how the Australians maintained a collective spirit and a British unit which camped on the other side of the river didn't. They died of cholera or dysentery. They just died like flies. And where, 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 where Bluey said that, you know, he used to have to walk out through the shit, it was, what concerned me was walking out over the dead bodies. The, all the dead bodies would be lying there as you walk down. Now, only this creek divided us and the survival of the fittest on one side and this collective spirit under the weary. And that's never left me, never. The prison camp, you had, that, you had that session before you died when you were sick, when you were physically sick and when you were homesick, you just wanted not just your home but you wanted to be back in your country again where things were normal and you were bereft, you were bereft of every every civilised comfort. Mm. 
remember a fellow saying to me one day at Paso, 22 died today. You know, 22 died at Paso in one day. Mm. The fit men were to be sent to Japan. The fit men was a rather inappropriate term because no one was that fit really. They were 70 days at sea. They survived an American submarine attack on their convoy and then they were hit by a typhoon. That last year of the war in Japan, I grew and developed myself and the kindness and the working comradeship, sharing a Red Cross parcel for the, my former Japanese workmates. I found I didn't hate them at all. It was just militarism and fascism. And I do, and I don't use that word, hate, because it's too negative. Um, Martin Luther King expressed it in a beautiful way. He said, hate is always tragic. It distorts the personality and it scars the soul. It's more injurious to the hater than it is to the hated. And then the day shift, we finished at 10 o'clock, half past 10, 11 o'clock, they started to come in from the mines and the miners had told them the war had finished. So uh, everybody got out of bed again and went down to the mess hut and sat down there talking and the Jap guards who would have slaughtered you for this under normal circumstances didn't come out of the guardhouse to take any action against anybody. Everybody knew then that it was over, yeah. But there was, there was no jubilation. There was no wild jubilation. I've read books since about places where the fellows cried and, fellows where the blo and, and where the blokes cheered, but there was no tears or cheers at our place. Everybody, it was, it was, it was overwhelming, I think. I think that was the point. It was overwhelming. Yeah. There are certain extraordinary characteristics about the five men I've known. Either well or reasonably well. That's Dad, Weary, Blue, Tom and Ray Parkin. Certainly in the case of all them, with the exception of Blue, and Blue might even be within this, there is an Eastern aspect to their thinking. That I find that very interesting. They have that Eastern way of detaching. They have that Eastern belief that the thing which really matters, when everything else is cut away, the thing that really matters is compassion. That's, that's what it's about. I saw the discoloration of that bomb and it, that, I didn't see the mushroom clown, but I saw the crimson colour and you've got no idea. If you saw the sunsets and the beautiful sunsets in Central Australia, magnified them about ten times, you might get something like it. One day about a week or so after the war finished, I remember a West Australian bloke coming into our, our, our room and he said, they've dropped a bomb on a town. It was no bigger than a football and it destroyed the town. And they reckon they've got more to drop in other towns, yeah. I thought that the dropping of the atomic bomb on both Nagasaki and Hiroshima was a crime against humanity. Now I know that, and I know that how much they're on their knees, and I know all the arguments for and against and everything else. 
And I think that we could have found other ways, a means of ending the war instead of the use of nuclear weapons. My, da my dad's a really spiritual man. No, he's, you know, he's seriously spiritual. And um, he, uh, for years, he's gone down at dusk every night and he's potted around in the backyard and no one really knew what he was doing and he'd be down there for hours and, and um, I don't know, about five years ago, one of my elder sister's children was diagnosed with schizophrenia and um, that was an enormous blow for Dad because he just thought it was such a cruel thing to have happened to a young person. And he actually thought it was crueler than the prison camps. And that threw him for a while. And then he, he came to this view that, um, that God was all the good that had ever been in the world. And um, he started thinking about all the good people he'd ever known. And uh, he has a sense of being able to commune with those people. And, um, and that's what he does a lot of nights. When he goes down there at dusk, he, he goes and visits people and he, he communes with them. And um, yeah, it's sort of like his dream time. And a lot of those are blokes that died on the line. Yeah. After the war, I was um, pretty full of hatred towards them. Yeah. I don't know for how many years, but in more recent years, I've seen documentaries on Hiroshima and how the people suffered there, in Nagasaki. Uh, and uh, I've been subject to the kindness of Japanese people. Our granddaughter, she went with her high school on a tour of Europe and Japan. She was billeted in Japan by these people who were so, so good to her, yeah. And, uh, and I would say that personally, I am very soft as far as the Japanese are concerned, yeah. But then I don't think that any, 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 any nation has superiority over any other nation when it comes to goodness. It's just that some nations have been misdirected along the way like Japan was. These men weren't spiritually defeated. Other people who have these sorts of experiences, they're often spiritually defeated. But these men weren't. And that's what makes them so special. And that's what made what they brought back so special. It was one of the greatest bloody experiences any young fella could have. I mean, I've got to say to some people, you've never had your feet off the bitumen. You haven't got your wings. You've been nowhere. It's nice to think that I've been somewhere. And that was one of the greatest things in my life, to go through that and get back and meet all the people that I did meet, included this fellow right opposite at the moment, and all these good blokes. Met a few bastards too, but... Uh, 99.9% .9 were good blacks. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> now you got me. When the railway started to operate, the Japanese started to bring back their uh, wounded from Burma. And uh, one day, the Dunlop was still up in the line somewhere and he got down on the train that was bringing back the Japanese prisoners and there's one there with his, he'd had his leg blown off or amputated or something, it was all gangrenous and uh, he, uh, 
he befriended him and uh, well, he, 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 uh, he gave him medical assistance uh, and he said because in the Buddhist religion uh, all men who suffer are equal. Mm. I think that I think all of Dad's six kids I think we were all deeply influenced by him without actually knowing it at the time because he was the opposite of paternalistic. He didn't sit you down and tell you what you ought to be. He did the opposite. He didn't tell you at all. <laughs> but at the same time, he lived a certain sort of life. And when he expressed views, they were just so different and so unusual and so interesting that he was intriguing. And that I think all of us, that set all of us off on a journey to find out who he was and why he was. And the six of us have all been back to the Burma Railway. We've all been back. And we've all made the pilgrimage and we've all, we've all sought to understand it. And, and in our different ways, we all do different things, but I think the values we have are pretty much the same. And, uh, and my mother's certainly a huge influence in her way, but, but there is a sense in which we are very much children of the line. I would say for, for me, for all the old prisoners of war, what they went through was the defining thing in their life. Absolutely the defining thing in their life, yeah. The last time I sat in a room with a group of people and watched that documentary, the people were Japanese. That was at the University of Sydney two years ago. When the film ended, no one spoke. I had agreed reluctantly to answer questions at the end of the film. It had occurred to me that there might be none and how awkward that would be. Eventually there was one from a Japanese woman journalist seeking more explicit information about some detail of the story, then silence. Not all reconciliation gestures succeed and you attempt them in that knowledge. At times when you make reconciliation gestures, you hover on the edge of absolute emptiness and absurdity. And that was pretty much how I was feeling when we filed out of the hall into the forecourt for a cup of tea. I was there on my own for a couple of minutes 
when a Japanese woman, roughly my own age, approached me very quietly. She was from the Centre for the Moving Image in Tokyo. How would I feel if she put Japanese subtitles on the documentary and showed it at the Japanese film festival? I said I'd be delighted. But what does that mean? Well, being realistic, it may mean 30 or 40 people in a tiny theatre somewhere in Japan seeing the doco. A little thing. But as a wise young woman once said to me, big things are just lots of little things coming together. And I am happy to keep doing little things, in good part because it is my way of staying sane. Before the documentary was shown to the Japanese audience, I gave a brief talk. I actually said to the Japanese audience what I had said several years earlier to an audience of Israelis and Palestinians in Jerusalem when I was involved in another peace initiative, the half-Israeli, half-Palestinian AFL peace team. I told both groups that most of what I know about reconciliation I learned from Aboriginal people like Patrick Dodson, Archie Roach, Aunty Joy Wandon Murphy, Uncle Banjo Clark, Michael Long, the list goes on. Patrick Dodson gave me one of the sayings I lived by when he said of reconciliation, the struggle never ends, the reward is the people you meet along the way. In 2009, I went with Jimmy Steins, the then president of the Melbourne Football Club, to Ewan Demu on the edge of the Tanami Desert, 300 kilometres northwest of Alice Springs, and the home place of star player Liam Jarrah. Everyone, including the Ewan Demu community, knew Jimmy was dying but he had made a pledge to visit the home place of every player on the Melbourne list and with his legendary Irish determination, he was going to do it. I saw Liam Jarrett two weeks ago and asked him about that day. What did it mean to the community? He said they were, quote, overwhelmed by it, especially the old people. The feeling of peace of balance and deep mutual respect that followed the arrival of Jimmy Steins and Liam Jarrah in Ewan Demu that day continues to shine in my life like a light. About 10 years ago, I interviewed Irish artist Robert Ballard, who was one of those who worked behind the scenes to bring about the 1998 Good Friday Peace Accord in Northern Ireland. He provided me with another of the sayings that I live by. In the end, he said, there is no alternative to dialogue. The AFL peace team was not a perfect project. The Palestinian community basically saw it as Israeli government propaganda. But within the team, there was a dialogue. How do I know? Because I was there in Jerusalem when it happened. And what amazed me about the dialogue was that afterwards I learned that none of the Israelis had ever previously sat down and spoken to a Palestinian and none of the Palestinians had ever previously sat down and spoken to an Israeli. One of the Israelis told me he was gobsmacked to find the two groups didn't even agree on which parts of history they disagreed on. I would say a lot of non-Aboriginal people in this country have never sat down and spoken to an Aboriginal peace person. And I'd further say a lot of non-Muslims in this country have never sat down and spoken to a Muslim. And what I'm here to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, is that if you never sit down and talk to people, the only way you are going to know them is through the media. I wish to make absolutely clear my belief that there are always great journalists out there at work in the world 
taking risks because of a crusading belief in the truth. That's why around 100 of them around the globe each year get murdered and many more are imprisoned. But it is also my belief that the media in this country, in Britain and in the United States, contains prominent individuals and indeed organisations who profit from exploiting racial, religious and communal tensions. Indeed, at this time, these individuals and the organisations they represent are in the ascendancy. Certainly, if the Murdoch empire gets its way, one of the major voices for moderation in this country, the ABC, will be gutted. So we have the task before us, but we have always had the task before us. I take guidance and solace from the thinkers of antiquity. If a thought still has some currency after several thousand years, it must have something to recommend it. Lao Tzu, who lived 600 years before Christ, said, quote, a leader is best when people barely know he exists. When his work is done, his own fulfilled, they will say, we did it ourselves. 100 years later, Confucius's advice to a leader was, quote, go before the people with your example and be laborious in their affairs. Marcus Aurelius, Emperor of Rome from 161 to 180 AD said, quote, a noble man compares and estimates himself by an idea which is higher than himself and the mean man by one lower than himself. The one produces aspiration, the other ambition, which is the way in which a vulgar man aspires, unquote. I think we can agree the people such as Confucius, Lao Tzu and Marcus Aurelius deserve a place in the library of human wisdom and that for a long time we humans have been fairly clear about some of the essential ingredients required for stable societies. Now compare them to this statement by Donald Trump in 2015 about Republican Senator John McCain. In 1967, as an American pilot, McCain was shot down over North Vietnam and held as a prisoner for five years, an experience that included being tortured. Said Mr Trump, he's a war hero because he was captured. I like people that weren't captured. How staggeringly immature. How ignorant as to the random nature of war and the demands that it can make on those unfortunate enough to be caught up in it. By this rationale, Donald Trump would also dismiss Weary Dunlop's status as Australia's greatest hero of World War II. But I put it to you, if you were half starving and ill, if you were in the grip of a merciless captor, if your life depended not only on your leader's courage, but also upon his ability to never lose sight of the larger picture and to display a selfless concern for those beneath him, who would you choose to be led by? Weary Dunlop or Donald Trump? <laughs> I mean, seriously. To quote Blue Butworth, Donald Trump has never been off the bitumen. Is Donald Trump the only threat to world peace? Of course not. The recurring lesson of history, as I see it, is that the enemies of peace, those who would tip us into conflict with no regard for the consequences of their actions, speak all languages, inhabit all belief systems, religious and non-religious. I don't believe any pure system, any belief system is pure or can be kept pure indefinitely. Nor am I a pacifist, Although on my reading of the Gospels, there is no doubt in my mind that Christianity began as a pacifist religion, and I am certainly someone who has immense respect for the Quakers. But I knew as a young father I would do whatever was necessary to protect my children if someone seriously threatened their safety. Nor do I stand before you as someone preaching the ideal of world peace. I am not a utopian. 
But I also think that as a species, we can always do better and worse. And right now there are certain areas in which I don't think we can afford to do much worse. To quote Republican Senator John McCain from the Munich Security Conference earlier this year, quote, make no mistake, these are dangerous times. I am here to say that working for a peaceful future is a practical matter like building roads. For too long there has been an attitude in this country that we don't really have to work for peace because wars are always fought over there in other places, foreign places like Vietnam and Korea and Afghanistan. Well, maybe not anymore. But wherever wars are fought, let's never delude ourselves. To quote American Civil War General William Tashuma Sherman, war is hell, and right now it's a new and rapidly expanding idea of hell. In Napoleon's days, armies generally lined up against one another in a paddock outside a city. Men slaughtered men. Modern warfare is Aleppo. Hospitals are targets, schools are targets. Civilians of all ages and both sexes are killed and maimed. We're not honest about war. We act surprised when young men and women sent off to fight in these wars on our behalf return with post-traumatic stress disorder. What exactly do we think we're sending them into? I value aspects of the Anzac tradition, particularly the idea that respect outweighs rank. But why don't we talk about what a disaster Gallipoli was? They were young men who never had a chance. Someone in high command blundered. Why do we never talk about the blunder? We would if it was a football match. When I say I'm for peace, I mean I'm for finding a common way, one that can carry a mass of people forward in what best approximates to a civilised fashion. I don't believe I'm the only person on the planet who wants this. We are now being fed the idea that certain groups are our enemy, but the people I know from those groups don't want to be our enemies. I want to talk to them I want to listen to them. I do what I do because it is one way of staying sane amid all the bad news, finding a bit of good news, and because Patrick Dodson is right. The struggle never ends. The reward is the people you meet along the way and walking the reconciliation path I've met giants. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Martin. Um, I think you'll all agree, quite inspirational talk. Can you hear me? Indeed, when I was watching the short doco just now, I was struck how people's experiences in war give them just a wonderful capacity for humanity. It's a terrible irony. On behalf of the University of Tasmania, thank you very much for joining us here this evening to deliberate on peace and hopefully see ourselves as part of a wider community and the opportunity that this allows us to create peace and a harmonious society. I'd now like to invite Joe Archer, Chair of the Peace Trust, to say a few words to conclude our evening. Thank you, Martin. Very humbling. I'd like to thank you and your family members here tonight, but I'd like to thank you for, for coming to Tasmania and being part of the Tama Valley Peace Festival. Your message is important for so many reasons, but not the least because you are a Tasmanian and um, you and your family have shaped a lot of Tasmanian thinking. Um, for many of us in this room, I see a lot of Longford people. Your father, um, had a deep connection to us through our primary school 
So it is a, um, a wonderful journey. Rebecca, thank you for tonight. And um, please take our thanks back to the university and the, Tas uh, the University of Tasmania Advancement Office and um, the powers that be for their support of the Peace Festival. And if I can thank Nicole Wilcox and Michaela Lightfoot for their work in bringing this event together. I'd also like to thank um, major supporters of the Tama Valley Peace Trust. We all work voluntarily and we all share a common goal of achieving peace um, at a local level and hopefully impacting views and behaviours more globally. Um, we wouldn't exist without the support of the WD Booth Estate and a little grant from the City of Launceston. Um, I don't think there's anybody here from the WD Booth Estate, but I did see Ross Hart sneak in earlier, and he was very instrumental in helping us when we were setting out. So thank you, Ross. Um, I'd like to acknowledge uh, fellow trustees, Janine Healy, Tam Foster, Donna Bain, and Hugh McKenzie, and Mark Baker. They all give hundreds of hours to make this festival happen and to deliver the objectives of the Peace Trust. So we, um, we're all fairly tired right now, but we're feeling inspired by the activities of the last week. I'd also like to thank the, uh, Mark Baker in particular and the examiner team. As I said, we have no money, therefore we have no budgets. And we're very appreciative of the examiner's role, not only in promoting our events, but in creating awareness of the aspirations of the Peace Trust. So Mark, if you could take those thanks back to your team and also to the ABC, if there's anybody here in the room. Reflecting on the 2017 festival, I believe we have um, succeeded in achieving um, the goals of our founder, Mrs. Jean Hearn, in providing our community with a stage on which it can demonstrate how it would like to uh, express peace, to learn peace and to teach peace. And of activating former governor Peter Underwood's call for us to strive for peace on a daily basis. Both of those leaders um, expressed frustration, I suppose, that we all strive for peace, but very few of us actually do anything. And uh, it certainly motivated a few of us to act and we were very inspired by Peter Underwood's 2014 Anzac Day Address when he called on us to honour those who had been maimed or died in war uh, by doing something to change the way we resolve conflict and to do that in a non-violent manner, be that in our homes or in wars. So I feel that we are working towards achieving those goals under the banner of the Peace Festival this week, we've facilitated dozens of cultural, community and thought leadership events that have directly engaged thousands of locals and um, particularly young people. We had the Human Rights Commissioner, Ed Santow, down last week speaking to nearly 2,000 young adults and his message was very powerful and very targeted in helping those people, to, those young people um, develop ways and means of being more peaceful and promoting peace in their cohorts. Through fabulous media coverage, we've also planted the seeds of peace far and wide. It's important to reflect on um, the outcome of Jean Hearn's vision, and I might add that Jean is now 97, and after not being so well last week, is back fighting on all fours, on uh, all cylinders, I um, rang today expecting not to hear very great news about her well-being to find out that she was up and um, um, having the newspaper read to her and eating three meals a day. So you can't keep a good woman down. But it was Jean's um, drive and determination that inspired so many of us not just to aspire to a more peaceful world but to actively do something. I encourage you to join us next year. Head to our website. There might be things that you can do, and it doesn't matter if it's through your book club or your library or a sporting group. There are many ways in which you can engage in helping promote, teach and learn peace in our community. Before I wind up, I um, want to particularly acknowledge Sonia Hindram's contribution to the Peace Festival. Um, Sonia gives thousands of hours to the Peace Festival 
and um, makes everything run smoothly. But we don't just get Sonia, we get a whole family. And uh, Sonia, I've got a little gift down here and I'd like you to come down here right now for this tipple of Tasmania and be publicly acknowledged for the um, great work you do. I'm sorry to make you do that in the dark. But Um, I think that's just about me for tonight. Um, if you are interested in supporting the work we do, have a look at our website. If you would like to make any small donation on your way out, I did steal, and I don't have the university's permission to ask you this, so sorry, Rebecca, but you know, better to ask forgiveness than permission. Um, I've stolen a jug from the bar and put it by the front door. And if you would like to leave a little donation to help us um, achieve uh, our aspirations, you're very welcome to. Thank you again, Martin. We are, I know, humbled and, uh, and moved by your uh, involvement today. And I hope we might be able to engage your thinking and um, background more. Thank you, everybody, for coming and enjoy your evening.